um, he marries a Canaanite um, woman. And, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, with uh, this woman, who is uh, the daughter of Shua, she, uh, they have three sons, Er, Einan, and Shelah. Er becomes marriageable age. They marry him off to a woman named Tamar. But Er was evil in the eyes of God and quickly died without children. So in accordance to the laws of the Leverite marriage, laws that we learned in Rambam, where a man goes childless, so therefore a brother would marry instead to keep his family name alive. So now um, it comes up to the next child, Onan. But Onan too was evil in the eyes of God and, and died at an early age. And she remains a widow. Who's next in line? The third son, Shelah. But Shelah grows up and it seems uh, very obvious that Yehuda had no intention to marry him off to Tamar. So this is where we pick up the story. Yehuda is leaving his home for after mourning for the loss of two sons. And she takes drastic actions, Tamar. So let's turn. Thanks, Parsha. Okay, let's share the page. There we go. Is it legible? Could be a little bigger. Better? Ta-da. Yeah, it can. Okay. Okay. Many days passed, and Shua's daughter, Yehuda's wife, died. Yehuda was con consoled, and he and Chira, his Adulamite friend, went up to Judah's sheep sharers in to Timnah. And it was told to Tamar, saying, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow garb, covered herself with a veil, wrapped herself, and sat down at the crossroads that were on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shela had grown up, but what, as for her, she was not given to him as a wife. Okay, so it seems like he's not getting, uh, she's not getting him. So when Judah saw her, he thought her a prostitute because she had covered her face. He turned aside toward her to the road and said, come now, I will come to you for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me that I should uh, come to, that you, you should come to me? And he said, I will give you a kid from the herd. She said, only if you give me collateral until you send it. So of course, the obvious question is, what's going on over here? Yoda, a moral individual, he has the intent to be with a prostitute. How do we understand this? So in the next verse, we're going to see that things are much more than meets the eye. Text number. Next text. Again, the story continues. So he said, what is the collateral that I should give you? And she said, your seal, your cloak, and the staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her. And he came to her, and she conceived from him. So what kind of seal did Yehuda give 
to Tamar. So Rashi explains. Rashi explains and he says, the Targum renders it, your signet and your cloak. The ring that you use as a seal and the cloak with which you cover yourself. So it's interesting that in Jewish law, marriage is sealed when a man places a ring upon a woman's finger. Now, the possibility of marriage is not only with a ring, it can also be done in three ways, as the Talmud tells us, by giving a valuable object, a contract, or by con consummating it through relations. So the practice today, though, is doing it with a ring. As we see the Ramah in the Code of Jewish Law, he says, is accustomed to betrothed with a ring, and there is a reason in the Tikkuni Zohar. What's the source for this custom? So some say it's actually the exchange between Yehuda and Tamar. This was the first marriage that was sealed by a ring. Hmm. So that gives a little dim uh, added dimension here to what's going on. It wasn't merely that he um, had time with a prostitute, but rather he made sure to make it legal. As it Balitesvis in the Talmud explain. Text number 4a. Some explain that their union was consecrated in marriage. This explains Talmud's wording. What will you give me that you should come to me? As if to say, what will you betroth me? To which Yehuda responded by saying, I will send a kid. She then said, only if you give a pledge, your seal, your cloak. This means the ring that you use as a seal so that he betrothed her with a ring. And as Rebbe explains, that many see this, or some at least commentators see this as our common day um, mitzvah that we do with a ring. This is the source. This week's Sicha, the Rebbe says, Balatesu suggests that Yehuda betrothed her with this ring, that by giving Tamar his signet ring, Judah, Yehuda betrothed her. This serves as a source for the custom to betroth with a ring. Now it actually records a conversation between the two. And Yehuda asks her, are you, are you, um, not, are you a, um, an idolater? She says, are you an, a, 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 not an idolater? Actually, not the, the, the Hebrew word, I have to take a look. A, um, a non-Jew? She says, no, I'm a convert. Or perhaps you're married. I said, no, I'm an unmarried woman. Maybe your father betrothed you without your awareness. He says, no, I'm an orphan. Or perhaps then you're impure. He says, no, I am pure. In other words, Yehuda went to great lengths to ensure that there was nothing wrong with this union. Now, on the, uh, that's from Yehuda's point of view. For Tamar, on her point of view, the Malbum writes, one of the commentators, he says that, Shela was the third son of Yehuda, was frightened to marry Tamar and actually had some legal recourse not to marry her or to be the Leverite um, marriage because the first two brothers had died. And therefore, he rejected her. This is how she understood things. And therefore, being rejected, she's free to remarry her next potential husband. And who could that be from the family? Yehuda. Yehuda. So it turns out that Yehuda and Tamar indeed uh, unite in marriage. And this is the pledges that he gives, including the ring. So the question that we need to understand, at this point, there was no established precedent to affect a marriage by a gift of a ring. So where does this idea come from? Why? 
why does Yuda marry her with a ring? And why is this then serving as the source for all Jewish marriages thereafter? Again, according to some of the commentators. So what we're going to see in the signet ring that Yehuda gave is rich of, of symbolism that explain the idea of two halves of one soul that are reunited to become as one. Two opposites, male and female, unite and become one. And we also see how this reflects it, not just in a relationship with, uh, with another through marriage, right, between male and female, but also how that reflects in our lives of a weekday and Shabbos, and how those two things also come together as one. All right, are we good? Any questions? Yeah? Are good folks? Following? Uh, yeah? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so let's return to Tamar's question. When Yehuda asked, what is the pledge that I should give you? She didn't say a ring. She said a seal. The Hebrew word for a seal is chasimcha. The conventional word for a ring is a tabas. So why she asked for a seal? Why not for a ring? Now we're talking about a signet ring. So it's a ring with a seal. What was the value, the, the importance for her to have a signet ring with a that has a seal as opposed to just a ring? What is the significance? So let's back up a moment. What happened over here in this union? What did this produce? Ultimately, it, it is the forerunner of Mashiach. The union here between the two, Tamar and Yehuda, that she is pregnant and gives birth. She gives birth to a, a son by the name of Peretz that has a very distinct messianic ring to it. Let's continue the storyline. So the parsha continues and tells us the time of her birthing, behold, there were twins in her womb. When she was giving birth, one put out a hand, and the midwife tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. As he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out, and she said, how you have burst forth, making a breach for yourself. And you would have called him Peretz. And afterwards, his brother came out on whose hand the scarlet thread, and he named him Zerach. So the Medrash picks up on the messianic overtones in the name of Peretz, which literally means who breaches, who ruptures the natural order of things, right? As we saw in the verse over here, Zerach came out first, but um, Peretz pushed his way and breached and came out before his brother. As the uh, Medjur says, and she said, how you have burst forth making a breach for yourself. This is the King Mashiach of whom it is written, the disruptor has gone before them. Their king passed before them and God was at their head. So the, the prophet Micha uses parrots as a reference to Mashiach, as the name means a disruptor, a one who breaches. And that's exactly what Mashiach does. Makes a disruption to the natural order of this world to transform it from nature that seems to be um, been there, done that. It seems to be no change, sunrise, sunset, 
the world is cyclical, there is no change, and comes Mashiach and is going to disrupt it all and turn the world upside down. That which is down will then be on the upside, and that which is now on the upside will be on the downside. Today we honor wealthy people in money, and we frown upon humble people of soul. But that will be all turned around. The humble of soul will be on the top, and the wealthy will be on the bottom. That's the disruption of the world that will come. So this relationship between Yehuda and Tamar was no casual engagement, a meaningless one. It was just, you know, uh, a fling of the night. It wasn't. It was the future of royalty of the Jewish people that would be born from this relationship. So let's understand a little more deeply what went on in that relationship, which is really indicative of all relationships. So we've learned uh, Chsidis, and we know about the 10 divine attributes. Right? There are two realities, the feminine and the masculine. Our world, where Mother Nature is seen to be in control, is referred to the power of Malchus, the last of the 10 divine attributes, and that is a feminine power. Right? It's the godliness that's found within the dimension of the limited world that comes from the feminine power of Malchus. It's like the nether mother that comes down to take care of her offspring. It's the Shrina that comes down to take care of creation. That's a feminine power, feminine energy, godliness within the world. But then there's a, a form of godliness that's beyond this world. It's called Zerampi. Literally means small faces. It's often the abbreviation of Za. Za Zerampi. That's the way the world is seen from God's perspective, which is supernatural. Is focused on the way God sees it and not from our perspective of seeing the world. That's a masculine energy. So what do we have over here? We have two powers that are opposite one of the other. We have the supernatural and the natural. And what they need to do is actually unite as one. Our physical world should mirror the spiritual world. Meaning, a union between male and female is a union of Malchus and Zal that is a reflection of that spiritual union. And this is the idea of a wedding. And this is what the previous Rebbe explains. In, what, in the teachings of a mimer, avoiding mimer. So he says, the groom is called the king, as we see in the Pirkei and the Jewish Pirkei Eliezer, the groom resembles the king, and the bride is called the queen, and the sphere of Malchus is called queen. The Zoyer states, a king without a queen is not a king, nor is he great. There is meant to be a union of the masculine and the feminine, as it is written, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them. For the groom and the bride take the form of the spheres of Zon Malchus. Hmm. So, what happens above is reflected down here, and that what happens down here. So what do we have over here in a practical sense? Feminine and masculine energy are represented in something of a cosmic uh, event. 
called childbirth. You know, intuitively, we feel that childbirth is something supernatural. The Talmud explains is because it takes three to tango. It, it takes mother and father and God. Why does it mean? Why is that? Because think of it. You know, I mean, we're, we're just used to because this is part of the way of the world. But because there is a union between masculine and feminine, between father and mother, therefore there's a child that's born. I mean, how do we get there? Okay, so, you know, okay, well, again, we know that that's part of nature and the way of the world. But when you think about it, it's quite a supernatural thing. Because what we have here are energies that are supernatural of Zol, and then the energies that are natural of Malchus, they unite together uh, above, and that allows for the union down here below of male and female, that it should bring something godly. What is the godliest thing that could be done? Is to create life itself. That's why life is, is sacred. It's because God is the force of all the life. And that a mother and father can come together and create life is intuitively we feel supernatural. We see, we sense the awesomeness of what happens in the, in the birth of a child and all aspects of it. Because there is this supernatural union with the natural, they come together as one. And that's the important point over here. It's not just like, wow, this is a miracle, but it's a miracle that's happening in a natural manner, right? There's miracles that break the rule of law. And then there's miracles that are engaged with the rule of law. And that's really, in a sense, what a, child, a birth of a child is. Something supernatural, awesome, beyond, and yet within nature itself. Let's uh, bring this all back to Yehud and Tamar now. We said that they named their child Peretz, right? And this is the son that will be the progenitor of the ultimate redemption of Mashiach. Because what is, well, what are we talking about over here is a union between supernatural and natural. That's the uniting of Zohan Malchus. And this is what Yehuda and Tamar embody. That union and how do they make that union? Through the signet ring, because the signet ring is a combination of signet and ring. Let's explain. A ring is perfectly circular, which shows on the natural cycle of life, how everything repeats itself, right? Everything repeats itself is, in a sense, you know, been there, done there, done that, because I was at this point in the circle, that point of the, I've experienced every point in the circle. That's the, the idea of a ring. And that's why a ring in Hebrew is called matbeya, which comes from a teva, nature. A ring represents the cycle of life that is nature repeating itself. But Tamar didn't ask for a matbeya. And that was one of the questions we asked. Why didn't she ask for a ring? She asked for a signet ring. She asked for a chaysamcha. I want your seal, the seal that's on the ring, the signet ring. The, the seal, that represents a godly energy that transcends nature. The ring represents nature, the cycle of life. 
the signet the, is a godly energy that transcends, represents that godly energy that transcends nature. Let's understand. The signet, what is that? That's the, the stamp, right, on the ring. That's the authentication of, you know, this person. I'm giving the stamp of approval of my ring, right? That's authenticating that it's, you know, coming from the king. It's coming from whoever is authenticating, right? Other uh, the truth of that person. So ultimate truth can only stem from an absolute God that is unchanging and unbounded, never changes. And this is hinted to in the Talmud. So the Talmud tells us, the tractate Shabbos, it tells us that Amar al-Khanina, the seal of the Holy One, blessed be he, is truth. Ah, so God has a seal. Not a ring, but a seal. And what is that truth? Meaning, truth is something that's totally consistent. As the word emes in Hebrew is the first letter, the middle letter, and the last letter of the Hebrew alephay, meaning from big, uh, beginning, middle to end, is unchanging, constant. Beyond the changing of tides, of a fashion, of values, it is never changing. It's always true. That's God's seal. That defies nature, which nature is bound by its rules and limitations. So what do we have here? We have a ring and the signet of the ring. We have the ring that represents the cycle of life nature. And then we have the signet that's part of that ring, right? Which is then representing the transcendence of nature, the truth of God. And God is not bound by the natural law. Of course, he's the creator of it. And what we have here is a unique combination of the two that come together. Beyond nature, with nature. Zol and Malchus. So as we explain, divine attributes of God, the emotive attributes beyond creation, and then Malchus, which is the source of creation, the godly energy that is focused in the limitations of creation. And those two unite together in above to bring into this world, the infinite and finite united in this world. That's what Yehuda and Tamar did by having relations, by bringing the infinite and the finite together in a child called Peretz, who Peretz breaks out of the limitations of the nature of this world, as is indicated in his very name. That he breaks the rule of law. Okay. He should have been the second one out, but kind of jumped out in front, right? And this then is the signet ring that she says that I need to have in order to make this relationship happen. The ring that represents the cycle of life, the signet that represents. As the signet represents who belongs to. A ring is just a ring. You can never tell necessarily who belongs to. But when it's a signet ring, so then, right, you know who belongs to. And in this instance, in the metaphor, the ring is nature. God's hidden. Madbeya. Nature. The hiddenness. But when it's a signet, it's not hidden anymore. Because the truth of God is beyond nature and therefore is revealed. Where? In nature. Of course, this is the difference between the two names of God. Shema Vaya, Yudke Vavke, Yudinahe Nabavanahe, which is Haya Haiba Biya Kecha, past, present, and future is one in one name, because that's God as he transcends. And that is the divine name of God that is the truth and the seal of God. And then you have Shem Elohim, which is numeric value of 86, Elohim, Tevo, which is 86 nature in Hebrew Teva, 
the word matbeya is 86, which is God within nature. So what do you have over here? You have the union of the two that come together, right? The two opposites coming together, bound together in a ring, bound together in a union between two opposites, male and female, you can't get more opposite than that. The Zohan Malchus, <laughs> as it represents. And that uh, two opposites bring the, a divine light of a child, an awesome thing that is beyond nature, within nature. And in this particular union, it brings the ultimate, the one who is going to bring the light of God that's beyond nature, within nature, and show that nature is nothing else but a divine light. Peretz, the son of Yehuda, who Mashiach comes from. Is that clear? At this point, you should not be comfortable in your skin. You should be jumping out of your skin with what we just learned. Like this is awesome. <laughs> An awesome thought and teachings. That brings so many different ideas together and you see the harmony between all of them. It's beautiful. Clear? We're good? All right. Amazing. Yes, my friend. Okay. All right, let's go a little further. So we're speaking about Zohan Malchus, two opposites, infinite and finite, male, masculine, um, the union between Yehuda and Tamar. With all of that in mind, let's look at the following Medrash. Rabbi Shaliyah said to Rabbi Shmuel Bar Yossi, have you heard from your father what on the seventh day God finished means? What does it mean? Geneva and the rabbis discussed the matter. Geneva said the analogy is a king who makes a wedding canopy, decorates a beautiful paneling, what is still missing, a bride to enter into it. Is in this way, what was the world still missing? Shabbos. So God created everything, right? The king he made the wedding cap. He decorates everything is beautiful. There's one thing missing, the bride. What's that? Shabbos. What was the world missing? Right? Shabbos. The rabbi said the analogy is a king who formed a ring. What was missing? A seal. In this way, what was the world missing? Shabbos. So God finished the creating the world at the very moment Shabbos began. There wasn't a moment, it wasn't like God created the world, took a little, you know, took a little break, and then Shabbos came. No, right from creating the world, the Yechalelukim, God ended immediately, Come Shabbos on the split of a hair. So obviously this is implies that Shabbos is not just the termination of work that happened before that. But Shabbos is also an active task. As Reb Shalia wants to know, what did Shabbos do to make the world complete? It wasn't like there's a world called six days that you work. There's a doggy dog race that you got to be a part. Then you got to jump off the world for a day. It's called Shabbos. No. It wants to know what did Shabbos give to creation? Not what did Shabbos give merely for, you know, removing yourself from creation. 
right? So, you know, you need time off. You need vacation. You need to get away. You know, your boss is, an, an, is enough already. The children, uh, it's, it's too much. You need to get away. You'll come back. But that's like living in two different worlds. A weekday workaholic world where money, 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 you know, accomplish, accomplish, accomplish. And then, okay, enough, enough. I got to give that a break and I, I just got to jump off. And no. Shabbos brings a completion not for the day of Shabbos alone, but it brings completions the six days before it. And we have two analogies to understand this. Right? We'll start with the second analogy, the seal of God. Well, hmm, we understand what a seal is, right? A seal is attached to the ring. The ring is the mundane six days of the cycle of life. But attached to it is the signet ring, is the stamp, the seal of God, the truth of God, meaning that we it's a reminder shabbos is a reminder not that i just need to get away from the world no that the world is not really a mundane world that is a jungle that it's a rat race and i've got to you know be on top of that i don't know as the minchas chinuch says the message of this mitzvah behaving in this way of rest on Shabbos is meant to awaken an awareness of the greatness of the day and instill in our hearts a belief in the creation of the world. For in six days, God made it. By resting on the seventh day, we remember the creation of the world. From when we sit back down on Sunday, the people ask us, what inspired you to rest? The answer is that in six days, God made it. With this, we'll strengthen our once true faith. So what the Chinech is doing, he's tying in the six days of the, world, uh, uh, of the week when we return to a regular ring of life, the cycle of life. We will return to that. We need to bring the perspective of Shabbos with us. That Shabbos is part of that world, that the peace and tranquility is part of it. As during the world, a week, I can feel broken. Shabbos, I'm whole and complete. So really, I have to take a Shabbos with me that I'm whole and complete. That's a signature, signet ring of God Almighty. That just like the signet ring tells us who is the owner of that ring, because it's his stamp. So likewise, that when Shabbos affects us properly, we can go into the world and then the world will know who's our owner. God Almighty, the truth of God still reflected in me and a part of me. Right? As we explained previously, the divine energies of the male and female above, Malchus, the feminine divine energies, and Zah, the masculine divine energies, they come together as one. And the signet ring, as we explained, so Shabbos and the weekday flow one into the other. So God finishes, Shabbos comes immediately because one is to complement the other, to come as one. We're not fractured people, and therefore we have one kind of life for six days, and then we have to drop off that world on the seventh day. Or like when we go on vacation, we, you know, we throw off the shackles of the rat race that we live in. And now I'm in peace and tranquility. No, it's got to be one flowing into the other. And of course, this is also the first analogy that the Medrash gives of the wedding canopy, that the king prepares the wedding can canopy. Everything is set, but then you need the cool the queen to come, you need the kala to come, and that's of course Shabbos. And of course, the common theme of Shabbos that we sing Friday nights, the Lachadoidi, come my beloved, 
to greet the bride, the countenance of Shabbos, we shall receive. Imagine how sad it is that you set up a wedding canopy and the bride doesn't show up. So likewise, God creates six days and Shabbos doesn't show. We're out to lunch on Shabbos. We're out you know, doing lunch on Shabbos with our friends because that's when we can have time to do lunch. Or we're out on the golf course on Shabbos. Or we're out you know, shopping on Shabbos. Just so no, the bride didn't show up. God creates a world that should flow into the queen coming onto the canopy. And this is exactly um, what Shabbos should do for us. It should move us not only that we have a wonderful Shabbos, but that the weekday is also a very different weekday by the inspiration of Shabbos. So it ties this all in in this week's Sicha. A seal is not its own independent entity, rather a component of the ring. Thus, when Judah, Yehuda, for example, the seal simply proved that the ring belonged to Yehuda. So it is with Shabbos and all miraculous things. It is not something separate from the six days of creation. Rather, it is the seventh day of six days. It brings completion to the world. In the words of our sages, what was the world missing? Shabbos. This means the perfection of nature itself is achieved by drawing the supernatural into it. Just like the ring is a cycle of nature and the signet is that which is, represents beyond, right? God is, his seal is truth, the transcendent of the human condition. Um, but they come together as one. The signet and the ring come together as one beyond nature, within nature, and therefore we get a taste of beyond nature on Shabbos, that we can then take that taste and bring it into nature of the six days of the week, that we inject it. And therefore, the ring is no longer a ring, but a, a spiraling ring. <laughs> so therefore, we're not just been there, done that, another Shabbos under the belt, another... You know, under the you know the same old, it's not the same old, because when Shabbos we get this true spiritual, transcendent nature of what Shabbos is, it inspires the weekday that even the mundane activity is not the same old, but something new. We see the newness, the goodness, the 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 beauty in in a regular mundane activity. And where does this all come from? Our story of Yehuda and Tamar. Any questions? Welcome to some people I didn't see at the beginning of the class. Jeffrey, welcome. Diane, I think, no, I saw you maybe. Michelle, welcome. And Sarah, and Livsha. Everybody else I said hello to. I think so. And if I didn't, I'm saying hello now. <laughs> you don't all say hello at the same time. Or goodbye. Bye -bye. Or goodbye. <laughs> uh, all right. Beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you for that. <clears throat> God bless. So a good job to everybody. It's Yutes Kislev. I'm going now to Fabring at uh, another Chabad house um, in the South Shore to celebrate. And um, tomorrow we're going to make the Fabringen. I, I, I just have to confirm because I was supposed to have a Fabringen um, tomorrow night also, but uh, I think something wasn't confirmed. Anyways, I'll keep you posted. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Be well. Good night. 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 Good night.